What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. In last week's video, I covered Chris Rock's comedy special on Netflix, Selective Outrage, where he finally spoke up about that moment where Will Smith came on stage at the Oscars and slapped him across the face. And the discussions we were having in the comments were amazing. A lot of you had some really great things to say, but a few of you pointed out that there's one part of the special that I left out. And this was on purpose. The part that was left out was right at the end. The last thing he says, and he drops the mic, and we get a lot of stuff in the body language. And the reason that I chose to not cover it last week is there's a cultural element to that last joke that I knew intuitively that I'm not the right person to talk to you about this because I don't have all the insight about that. Behaviorally, I could talk about the body language, that's what I do, but there's a cultural element there that I just can't speak to. So this video is going to be a follow-up or I guess a part two to the first video, although you can start here because we're gonna be talking about all these things completely separately. And I've brought in two very special guests on the channel for this occasion. One of them is one of the world's top body language experts, and he's gonna help me break down what we see in terms of body language right there at the end. But my first guest is going to talk to us about the cultural element of that joke. So my first guest who has some incredible insight pertaining to the undertone of that last segment about how Chris Rock was raised comes to us from one of my favorite YouTube channels, looking into a lot of legal cases, a lot of political cases, a lot of current events, and some of the best insight on YouTube. All right, everyone, so I'm really excited to welcome to the channel my good friend, Nate the Lawyer. So excited, what's up, man? Hey, what's going on? Ah, same old, same old, you know, living in New York. I don't know if you can hear the sirens outside, but this is how it is living in the big city, you know? <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm super excited to have you here because, you know, this is our first official collab on the channel where you're physically here, but you're like, your voice is kind of in a lot of my other videos because anytime <laughs> I'm covering anything, from the black community or the african-american community we're on the phone the day before and i'm asking you you know for cultural context and i've always appreciated that you know uh, everything from when i covered uh yay formerly known as kanye west to uh megan the stallion yeah. to megan markle like we've always had these conversations because i call you and i go nate help <laughs> <I need that. laughs> and, and you've always been so kind and gracious but i'm so glad that you're here on the channel to talk about this Thanks for having me. No, this, this is it's 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 interesting because I, I think sometimes a, a lot of the context gets lost in a lot of these conversations. So it's great to you know it's great to understand kind of what's driving a lot of these conversations. So a lot of people go, Chris, how come you didn't do nothing back? How come you didn't do nothing back that night? Because I got parents. That's why. Because I was raised. And you know what my parents taught me? Don't fight in front of white people. <laughs> So the part I want to focus on here is that last line. So he yeah. sets up this thing about why he didn't fight back. And for me, behaviorally, I can understand why he wants to end on this. Even as an entertainer, I can understand why he wants to end on this. Because this is the question that he has probably been struggling with as well for a year. Like, why did I do this? You know, would I have been better off doing something else? Because he has to live with this. He has to live with this moment yeah. for the rest of his life. So he ends the set by saying, the reason I didn't hit back is because I, I have parents, I was raised, and that last line is, never fight in front of white people, mm -hmm. Mike Slam. Yeah. So I knew that there's something there that I don't quite understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I just want you to kind of take it away and tell us, and we hear, the, we hear a reaction in the crowd, and that, that's a big part of it for me as well. I was like, there are people in that crowd that are understanding something there, an undertone that I'm not. Yeah. So can you talk to us about what that line means and what it means to Chris? Well, people may be familiar with the whole don't air your dirty laundry, right? That, that's like a common saying, right? And that, that's usually, that usually signifies the in-group, right? If you're a part of the in-group, then as part of the in-group, you're not supposed to air your dirty laundry to the out-group, people who are not part of the in-group. And in Black culture, um, that also, there's, there's also like a second level to that. Where you know we have our, our personal family beef, but then we also have our kind of interracial beef, 
in terms of, you know, we, we have things that, you know, I might have an issue with you as a black person, but we don't want to perpetuate the stereotypes of angry black people. So we don't fight in front of white people because there's a, there's always been like the stigma that the black man is an angry man. That's what, that's why you always hear the angry black woman trope or, you know, black people can't control themselves or get emotional, that type of thing. So generally parents um, tell children, you know, you don't want to do this in front of white people. You don't want to do this in front of white people because you don't want to, you don't want to look like the animal that they, that essentially they already think you are, because that's kind of the way we grew up here in America. I think Chris Rock wanted to accomplish two things and the black community, he would look like a coward, right? Because the one thing that you always hear is somebody hits you, you hit them back. Somebody slaps you, you slap them back, right? Being number one, a man. And being up the in that moment, it's 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 the masculinity part. And even if you're white, even if you're Hispanic, you, we all know that machismo, right? If if another man comes and smacks you in the face, the it would have, it would almost be better if they punch you in the face, right? If another guy comes and punches you, it's almost like okay. But in the black community and the minority communities, being smacked by another man is the ultimate sign of disrespect. Usually, and, and think about this, um, back in the day with duels, um, back in the American Revolution, if another man smacks you in the face, then you got pistols and tried to shoot each other to kill each other, right? That was that was part of dueling. It was being smacked. So the it wasn't just the issue of him being hit. It was the way he was hit. He was smacked like a bee. And in response to being smacked like that, that is essentially symbolically in the black community, that's symbolic of one man challenging you as a man. I don't believe you're a man, so I'm going to smack you. And the response to such aggression from another man is, no matter how big or small you are, is to then respond with violence or with aggression to show that you are also a man and that you wouldn't accept something like that. So Chris Rock had to accomplish one goal, to explain to people, to have Black people particularly understand why he didn't do that, why he didn't go aggressive into his masculinity and respond in that way, but then also have them understand that not responding in that way was the right thing to do. That's why I think in the special, you had him kind of build build um, the both, hey, look, Will Smith is bigger, stronger, faster, that type of thing. You know, I was in this particular position on stage, you know, being a professional and he came up and did this and my, and I didn't respond the way, the way um, I would normally respond because I'm in front of all these blank people. I'm here in a professional environment. I did the right thing. And that's where you get the mic drop, right? Because he is the N word. Cause that's cause, cause we'll say is what, Will Smith did was what an N-word would do. But what Chris Rock did is what a black man would do. Understand the moment, understand the concept, and walk away. What he was saying is the easier thing for him to do would have been to respond with violence. The harder thing for him to do was to turn the other cheek and continue the show. That's what Chris Rock was trying to say in a funny way. And that's why I think you also saw the emotion um, at the end when, when he was saying it, because he was very emotional when he was saying it, but that's the emotion he was trying to say. And, 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 and you'll see it because, again, 90% of the people who saw that, that, most people would have been on the floor rolling around with him. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much for that. that that's incredible. It makes so much sense that there was this struggle with what he knows one community wants him to do, but then what the, the right thing to do is even given the rules of that same community. Like he's practicing what they're taught as opposed to what the reflex might be. That's beautiful. There's been some articles online um, that have said that for someone who ended the set by saying, don't air out your dirty laundry in front of white people, it's ironic because he technically picked a fight with Jada in front of white people at the Oscars when he made a joke about G.I. Jane. And now in the special, once again, He's taking something that Will did towards him and he's really going after Jada in this special. Whereas she, did, I mean, at least on the surface, and I, I, I can't emphasize that enough, on the surface doesn't seem like Jada went after him in any way. So there's some articles out there saying it's no different. You know what he's doing. He's going after Jada uh, and it might not be a physical attack, but like verbally twice in front of white people and then telling Will Smith off for starting a fight in front of white people. And 
these articles are suggesting there might be some irony there. I would love to get your thoughts on this. Do you feel like it's different because words, everything goes when it comes to words and comedy and how he chose the venue for this? Um, or do you see that there are some parallels between those two behaviors? Um, I, I don't think there's, there's any parallels in, in this sense. Chris Rock is a performer. He's a comedian. And as a comedian, he was told to go to the Oscars and the first time when he made the initial joke. And, and he was, you know, and Chris Rock's type of comedy is based on kind of current events. So I don't think that was airing Dirty Laundry. And if that's the case, then I don't think any black comedian or any Hispanic comedian or any Italian, no comedian could talk about their own community, right? Because let's not forget, Chris Rock, 90% of his jokes, 90% of his comedy is about his experiences, his life experiences with black people, growing up black, growing up in a black community. So if he can't talk about his experiences with black people, who he spends the majority of his time with, then he wouldn't be able to talk about anything, right? Because he wouldn't know about, about these things. You can go to any, any comedy show from black people, white people, whatever. And sometimes they may, they may make fun of you sitting in a crowd. There is, there is, there is, there's a saying that we all tell our kids, sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, all of a sudden, the argument is those words are as bad as the sticks and stones. And not only will they hurt you, if they're assault, assault on, on you personally. No, I, I just, I just, I reject the fact that black people are supposed to not be able to be civilized enough to respond to jokes with jokes in back or, or, or a verbal response. I just had a, a, a light bulb moment while you were saying that. Mm -hmm. Right in the beginning of his comedy set, he says, anyone who says words hurt hasn't been punched in the face. Exactly. Anybody that says words hurt has never been punched in the face. <laughs> So, maybe, so it's it's brilliant that you got here because although that's a joke that opens his set, it really references the fact that like words shouldn't be hurting you. You yes. know, it's not the same. So, so it's it's great how there's that subtle through line between what you just said and how he opened his set. And I completely agree. When it comes to comedy, we can we can go. I didn't find that funny. We can say that. But yeah, I mean, as an entertainer, for me, you know, it, it, it's absolutely off the table that you respond physically to something that you didn't enjoy in someone's comedy set. It's, 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 it's crazy to me. Watching the comedy special, I thought two things. I thought, um, number one, I thought his response, he, he attacked them both, right? So it wasn't really just Jada, it wasn't just Will. First, he attacked Will on his manliness, masculinity, right? He, he set you up to say, Will Smith is a punk is someone who is not this is not will smith and we know will smith because remember he said he was like suge smith or suge knight and suge knight so just so everybody knows suge knight was an actual gangster who killed people but he was a producer but he produced um a lot of the greatest rappers of all time snoop dogg or whatever it was, it was a record label called death row records so he was a, a true gangster and the knock on Will Smith from the black community was always that Will Smith was the clean rapper. He was the, the guy who, who was acceptable to white people. And Will Smith didn't curse on his records. And, and not, Sorry, not just from the black community, but even from white rappers like Eminem in his lyrics, in one of his songs, he says, Will Smith don't got to curse in his raps to sell records, but I do, so F him and F you too, so. <laughs> Will Smith don't got to curse in his raps to sell records. Well, I do, so f him and f you too. It wasn't just from the black community. It was pretty much everyone knew Will Smith is clean. Yes, 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 yes. He was clean. He wasn't fighting. He wasn't doing all that gangster stuff that, that Suge Knight and the rest of them are doing. Um, and I think that's how Chris Rock turned, turned it into now this situation. Now, all of a sudden, the guy who refused to curse his records, the guy who was out there, you know, kissing babies and all that stuff, the guy who was the good black guy, the, the representation of, if you want to be a rapper that's acceptable in the mainstream, you got to be like Will Smith. If you want to be like that guy, that guy is now the guy who on stage and smacking somebody when he's about to win an Oscar. And that, and so, so he was, so, so he essentially said, Will Smith was a punk. Will Smith was just doing this for, because, he, because, you know, he, he, he couldn't accept the fact that you know that that his wife had done this to him and she and now he was taking it will smith couldn't take it out on the person who actually wronged him which was his wife he took it out on 
on um, Chris. So then Chris transitioned to, but now let's talk about why he's taking what he's taking out on me because now you can't say all that and not explain why why he's upset right so now you're going to the entanglement right this is what happened right this is what happened and to be fair chris rock did mention too he said i've been doing he's been doing these stand-up comedies you know he's going over he's always doing stand-up comedy he's been doing he's a stand-up comic he's never done a set about the entanglements before so he's never aired the dirty laundry before, but now because it became relevant because he got smacked over it, now he says he's going to explain why he was smacked, and he was smacked because he believes that these entanglements happened. Will Smith had this emotional change to it, but it's really not toward Chris Rock. It should be toward his wife because he obviously hasn't overcome or hasn't really closed that chapter of why he's mad at his wife. Wow! 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 Dude, that is such great points like it, it it kind of there was a lot of this that kind of i i knew behaviorally like i'm seeing certain emotions there coming out but like the depth of the 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 cultural element here is incredible and puts it all together for me nate thank you so much for all this uh everyone please 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 go follow this man the link to his channel is in the description i honestly nate i don't just say this like i don't watch a lot of youtube but i watch your channel like oh, because there's, <laughs> it, it's such a perspective that i i don't no. So it really gives me a lot of context at times. And you know, I call you and yeah, like, yeah. Hey, you got to explain <laughs> this to me, man. And you're always so kind. So everyone, please go follow him. Nate, before we go, there's something that happened from my last week's video that blew my mind. I didn't mm -hmm. think that there was going to be this many different opinions on this thing that I thought was pretty simple. And I want to talk yeah. to you about it. And as you were talking there, ironically, there were certain things that relate to this. And it's kind of crazy to me how much there was about about this. How much it's like much ado about nothing. I feel it applies mm -hmm. to this. So basically, uh, in the set at some point, he started talking about how Will Smith is bigger than him, yeah. and he said, and and it, the, the way it was structured was really brilliant and kind of maybe as an entertainer, I intuitively understood the structure a little more. I don't know, but he started by talking about the literal. You know, he's I don't know if you know this, but he's much mm -hmm. bigger than me. That's literal and real life. Then he moved mm -hmm. to the fictional. Even in movies, he plays bigger roles than me. Uh, you know, he played Muhammad Ali, I played Pookie. Hilarious. Yeah. And then he went even further into the fictional by talking about animation. And he said, even in animation, he's bigger. I was a zebra, he's a shark. Or I'm a zebra, he's a shark. I know you can't tell on camera, Will Smith is significantly bigger than me. <laughs> we are not the same size, okay? Will Smith played Muhammad Ali in a movie. You think I auditioned for that part? <laughs> He played Muhammad Ali. I played Pookie in New Jack City. <laughs> Shit, even in animation, this motherfucker is bigger. I'm a zebra. He's a shark. And I pointed out the fact that Will Smith was never a shark. He was in a movie called Shark Tale. And to me, it seemed pretty simple. It seemed that it was just an oversight. That it was, it was a forgettable movie. You know, it's really not one of the big animated hits. So I think it's just easy to misremember that. Oh, Will Smith starred in a movie called Shark Tale. He's a shark. The joke works. He kind of put it out there. So in the comments, a lot of interesting things happened. And I was really <laughs> shocked to see this. The, the overwhelming majority, and even in the news, and even in, in a lot of other people who are covering it, is that he simply made a mistake. You know, he forgot that in Shark Tale, Will Smith wasn't a shark. And it's easy to do that because in most animated movies, the title references the main character. So like in The, the Little Mermaid is about a little mermaid. Mm -hmm. A Bug's Life is about a bug. Uh, Toy Story is about toys. So it's easy to misremember that Shark Tale is actually about a small fish. So yeah. go, Will Smith was in Shark Tale, must have been a shark. It's Even people in the comments said, I've seen the movie, totally forgot that he wasn't a shark. There were a few people who said that um, this was a comment on Will Smith's literal size. You know, So he's saying, I'm a zebra, but in real life, Will Smith is a shark. And to me, there's almost no chance of that being what he's going for because... He, he started at the literal, then went to the fictional. Now he's saying, even in animation, we got to look at that lead up. He's talking about in animation, I'm a zebra, he's a shark. He's trying to point out that in every universe, he's bigger than me. So I don't think he's commenting back to the literal and making this weird metaphor no. that Will Smith is a shark. Because also, if you wanted to make it seem like he preys on him because he's a zebra, he wouldn't go for a shark. He'd go for something that a zebra is actually scared of. So I don't think that that's what happened. And then there's this other one. A few commenters, and I'm, I'd love to get your opinion on this, said that 
there's this deep metaphor here that he purposely said this because the, the, the role Will Smith does play in Shark Tale is a small fish who's trying to act big. So by saying this, there's this metaphor that we're supposed to be like, oh, okay, he's trying to go for this irony of this fish who's trying to find his identity. Mm. But for me, the issue with that is this. First of all, the way he set that up as an entertainer, that yeah. it doesn't make sense. Doesn't he's, make sense. A, he's great with words. If he wanted to highlight that, he would have done it a lot more effectively. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have hid this metaphor in, in, a, in an inaccurate mistake during a punchline. It doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. And second, it kind of this would prove the opposite point that he's trying to prove. He's trying to prove that Wilson is bigger than him in every way. Mm -hmm. Why would his punchline be like, no, he's actually smaller than me and leave us with this convoluted metaphor? So I didn't think that made much sense. And finally, the reason I don't think that's what it is is because not enough people have seen Shark Tale that he would bank on us getting that reference. Like, yes, oh, we're supposed yes. to immediately be like, oh, yeah, Oscar is having an identity crisis. Like, I know that because I've seen the movie. So anyways, for me, it was very confusing to see like all these people going really deep. In, and even I guess I'm doing it now, too. I'm yeah. going deep into this joke. <laughs> but um, we were talking about this and you had some interesting insight as to why this may have happened. So, so why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about what you thought, why this joke, this inaccurate joke is in the special? Obviously, it was a mistake. Now, I think a lot of people don't realize two things. People think that Chris Rock just did that special and said those jokes for the first time then. That's not true. Chris Rock has been using these jokes for a couple of months now. He's been he's been testing them out, right? He's not going to the Netflix special testing your jokes for the first time, seeing if they're going to laugh. He's giving you, when he's getting paid by Netflix, the millions of dollars to tell jokes, he's telling jokes that he knows for a fact are getting laughs in the comedy clubs. He's not testing new material right there on the spot. Um, and for instance, there was a clip of Charlemagne the God on The Breakfast Club. And he even, he had actually seen the, sh the, the previous show before Will Smith did the Netflix special. And he said, hey, there's some other things that Will Smith got wrong. The fact that he said Charlemagne called um, Will Smith a B. Charlemagne said, I never called him a B. But then he did, Charlemagne said he didn't even correct Will Smith. He just let it, he said, I didn't even correct him because I knew it was a joke and I knew he was just doing it for the punchline. And then he said it again on the special. Charlamagne was like, yeah. He said, but yeah, but never said that. Interesting is I heard, uh, I heard Chris Rock do that set last month, right? Mm -hmm. At the North Charleston Coliseum in Charleston. Mm -hmm. And he did that bit and you know, he did the shout outs then, right? And mm -hmm. I was sitting there thinking like, should I correct him? But nope. then I was like, Nah, he got his special next month. That's so why I gotta make this man that shot me out in the special. That's right, drop a bomb. So, so, <laughs> drop a bomb. Like, I was thinking about correcting him when I heard no. it last month. Like, you know, I never I'm called what's never be, but I think, <laughs> nah, I'm gonna let that one go. Let's let it go. That might make the special. Damn. And sometimes the best comedy is something where you can just say, oh, the whole joke is factual because that's what makes it funny. But also, you have to give them poetic license to to not have, you know, to this is not, he's not telling a factual story in, in every single way. Some of the jokes, are going to are going to have inaccuracies in them, but that's the reason why we laugh at them because they're jokes. You understand what I'm saying? I absolutely agree with you, Nate. And I, there's two things I'm so glad that you brought up. The first one is that this material is, of course, tested. Because there was one or two commenters in my last video who were like, "No, no, he wouldn't have tested this because it might leak online." And it's like, I, I that's just funny to me because there is no way on this planet that an entertainer at this scale is testing material on a Netflix special. It's just not <laughs> happening. So the second thing I'm glad you brought up is the fact that there were those inaccuracies that were in there to drive a point home. Yes. And what clicked when you were talking for me is it's possible that at first the joke was something along the lines of I'm a zebra. He's in shark tail. Like that could have been the original mm -hmm. joke, but then maybe he delivered it a little different and said, I'm a zebra. He's a shark. And people laughed and he went, okay, that's Nobody really remembers what role he played. The joke works this way. Yeah, I, I agree a thousand percent. He probably went from he was in Shark Tale to, you know, he, he was, was a shark. shark. And, and it just, and it just, and it, it, it sounds funny, even if it's inaccurate. Right. I think to me, as a fan of animated movies, it, the first time I hit me, he's like, wait, no, he wasn't. Like that. that and I think a few people, a few people had that reaction because mm -hmm. in the comments, I had people like, yeah, me too. It was weird to me when he said that. In hindsight, I think I was, a li I, I, it kind of bothered me more than it would bother more most people because I was like, yeah. why is that in there? Oh, man, it's, it's annoying that like he never he never did that. He was Muhammad Ali. You were Puki. You were a zebra. Well, he wasn't a shark, and I was like all bothered by it. But yeah, I think that's all it is. It's just he found that that's the best way to deliver the joke, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, hundred percent. I, I want to. I, I do want to ask you something before we leave. Yeah. 
if Chris Rock, after he gets slapped, if he tackles and they fight on the floor, do you think his reputation would have would have been? Do you think the outcome would have been different? Because now he's fought back. Now it's been a struggle. Now it's that. Now he doesn't have that masculinity piece to it. Do you think that changes things? To some people, it would have been like he did the right thing and fought back. I think to some people that would be what it is, especially people who grew up with that mentality. Like when you get slapped, you fight back. I think to some people, I think to a lot of people, it just would have put him in the Will Smith category. And instead of it being Will Smith slapped Chris Rock, the headlines would have said Will Smith and Chris Rock got into a fight in front of everyone. And he would have been put into that inappropriate behavior category, which I think comes full circle. To, to how that's why you out. don't fight in front of white people. You explained it perfectly. Exactly what you said. Yeah. <laughs> Nate, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, bro. This is that. This is great. This is this is fantastic. I thanks, like the way you thanks. closed it up. I don't know. We could have planned it any better than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, 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 that's incredible. Uh, yeah. We just came full circle. Perfect. <laughs> A big thank you to Nate, the lawyer, for that amazing analysis and cultural perspective. Please go show him some love. I will leave a link in the description to his YouTube channel. It is one of my favorites. Go give him that subscribe. Watch his content. Learn from this man. He is an absolute genius. Now we're going to move on and look at the body language right at the end of the video. And there's some amazing stuff happening there. But before we do, do me a huge favor. Hit that subscribe button. Turn those notifications on for more body language and behavioral analysis videos. All right, now before we go on to our next guest and look at the body language right there at the end and what it suggests, just a couple of quick notes as a follow-up from the first video. Uh, a lot of people in the comments stated that, you know, this was live, so it can't be edited. So there are certain things that wouldn't be able to be edited out. Uh, that's incorrect. So there's a note at the end currently that says that this was broadcast live but then edited and there were things that were actually cut out. So it's just a little note to keep in mind and uh, I've talked to quite a few people who watched it live and it's hard. It's really hard to remember all the specifics and everything he said but so far I know for a fact that they cut out a joke about the movie Concussion where he said the wrong title and then he retook the joke. So the joke is still there, but there was a bit of a mess up that they cut out. Cause her man didn't get nominated for emancipation. This gives me a, f***ing, a, a f***ing concussion. No, not emancipation, I f***ed up the joke. Concussion. So far, that's the only thing I'm aware of that was cut out. Uh, if there are other things that some of you watched it live are aware of, you can let us know in the comments. But there was at the very least one thing edited afterwards. Another quick note from last week's video that I just want to clarify. Right at the end, I said when he was talking about his parents that he hit under the belt. And there were a few comments that said, you know, you disagree, it's not under the belt, it's his comedy special, uh, he could say what he wants. And I just want to say I completely agree. It's not that I disagree with that, it's that I, I misspoke. Sometimes when I'm filming these videos, you know, I don't think of every single word I'm saying, I'm just casually talking. And when I said hit under the belt, I didn't mean it was unfair or uncalled for. I simply meant it hit him where it hurt. Uh, you know, he knew that talking about the parents in that way was really going to make an impact. As someone who has a lot of friends who are entertainers, I absolutely believe that if it's their show, their venue, people are coming to see them, people are tuning in for them, everything goes, you could say what you want, and everyone has the option to not watch it. But yeah, when I said that, I just meant He's going for a gut punch, that's what I meant. My second guest today spent over a decade working for the Australian government in public relations. He is also a certified trainer for the Paul Ekman Group, which means he is a master at micro expressions and that's gonna come in really handy today. He also helped develop and now is a senior mentor at Joan of Arrow's Body Language Academy. I am super excited to welcome back to the channel my friend, David Stevens. <laughs> Thanks, Mighty. It's uh, it's always great to uh, collaborate, and it's uh, it's great to be here uh, with you today. I am so excited because we were having a conversation about what we see at the end with the body language, with the micro expressions, and I'd spotted a bunch of things, but you and I got really excited talking about it, and you had just some great stuff, and I was like, you got to get on the channel and talk about this. So here we are. We're gonna dive into this, but David, before we get to the body language that we're seeing here, and there's some really great stuff. Uh, I think the question on everyone's mind is, what did you think of the damn shark thing? 
Oh. Yeah, there's certainly been a lot of discussion about sharks, but hey, I'm an Australian. I'm I'm down under, and so you know, sharks. It's not a month goes by where we haven't got some sort of shark attack or shark sighting. So, look, you know, people can read a lot into these things, but I I tend to agree with you know with you and your um, what you've talked about so far in terms of um, look. There's a lot going on, but don't overread it. It's uh, just a comparison. It's on the back of a number of other comparisons. Yeah, that's it's funny. Um, and then they, uh, so uh, they so you, you so you're on board with the whole. There isn't this deep hidden metaphor here in this punchline to look into. I don't think we should be looking for a conspiracy theory here in this one. No, not at all. I completely agree. But there are a lot of things that we can look into with his body language right at the end of the video. So let's take a look at that. Don't fight in front of white people. David, I want to talk about one of the things that will jump out at anyone who studied facial expressions, micro expressions, and it's pretty textbook and it's right in the middle of your expertise. It's just as he goes to slam down the mic, just before he slams down the mic, we see something unmistakable on his face. We see one side of the mouth go up like this, causing a line on the side of the face right here, only on one side. Now of all the facial expressions that are universal, there is only one that is asymmetric. In other words, there's only one facial expression that doesn't look the same on both sides of the face. That's exactly what we saw right there. So David, why don't you tell us what that emotion is, what it looks like, how we can recognize it, and why we saw it here. Yeah, thanks, Spidey. Yeah, what we're seeing here is a you know textbook example of contempt. It's that sort of unilateral on the right-hand side of uh, of. Chris's face. What it really shows is his state of mind in that instance, uh, and it's all about him feeling uh, morally superior. Because this uh, sign of contempt, it's a great indication. In fact, the trigger for it is that we feel uh, morally superior in some way. So in this instance, he feels really good about what he what he says. In fact, it's a great summary of. Uh, how he's been feeling throughout this last piece of his engagement, a feeling that he has said what he needs to say and, you know, this is his moment. So that's reflected through this emotion uh, that you see in his face where he's feeling uh, quite good about himself and what he has portrayed. Right, so it's all about that moral superiority and just feeling on top of the situation, essentially, in that moment. And, and you know, he's been holding so much back for so long that he just got off his chest. And the first thing we're seeing before we see any of the other stuff we're going to talk about in a second is this kind of contemptuous, like, I did it kind of thing. And that's going to transform. It's going to turn into other things, but we see that contempt first. And that's really interesting. I do want to clarify something because it's something I see in the comments when I don't clarify. When we say that contempt is the only asymmetric universal emotion, it doesn't mean to say that contempt is the only asymmetric thing that can happen in body language. A lot of things are asymmetric. You might see someone who's suspicious or curious. You might see someone give a half smile to someone, you know, when they're greeting them or walking into a room. We could see a lot of things that are not symmetric, but there are only a finite number of universal emotions. In other words, emotions that look the same across all cultures on the planet and contempt is the only one of those that's asymmetric. So joy, for example, when we're happy, it's on both sides. When we're angry, it's on both sides. Contempt is only on that one side. Just wanted to clarify. Immediately after the contempt, we see something that a lot of people are talking about online. And it's not a mic drop. A mic drop is this. It's this fun, playful, you know, I drop the mic, I'm done, I take my applause. This was a mic throw. Like, there's this throwing gesture behind it. And I thought a lot about this moment, and I thought about, was this planned? Was it known that he was going to do this? And here's the thing. I've been a performer for over a decade. I've performed on a lot of big stages. And if ever I was going to be on a stage of that size and I was going to drop the microphone or do something like that sudden, I would advise the audio team, the sound technicians, that I'm going to do something like this for them to be prepared for that. Because if I don't and I throw that mic like that, that can make a shockingly loud noise and it can deafen the audience. Now, some sound systems have measures in place, features in place, that when the audio spikes, it immediately 
can diminish it or catch that or do something like that. But I don't know what audio system they were using. And even for him to know that, it's a conversation he would have had to have. So to a certain extent, a part of me is feeling, also, if this wasn't live, if this was something that was edited, I would say, okay, maybe it made that noise and in post-editing, they mitigated it. But in this case, it's live. We're hearing this very muffled when it hits the ground and we're not hearing the audience get startled or shocked or anything like that. So I, I think my gut is saying that at the very least, it was discussed that there's a possibility at the end he's going to drop the mic. I'm not guaranteeing at all that even he knew he was going to do it in this way, but I think it was part of the plan that at the end, he was going to, at the very least, drop the mic. Now, the other thing that's really interesting is the way it was done. This wasn't just a drop. There was intention there. There was emotion in the way it was done. So David, why don't you talk to us about what we're seeing there in that moment? Sure. Thanks, Spidey. Yeah, it's a, it really is a very dramatic moment. It's a very, it says a lot about everything that's happened just before that, leading up to this moment, this dramatic moment. And in fact, in one sense, it's a, it's a violent moment because up until this point, he has been using his words. And you've spoken about this before, about how his weapon is his words. That's how he is fighting back. That's how he is, uh, that's his outlet. Um, but in this one moment, um, you see him almost go beyond that. And, you know, we were talking before about how tennis players, you know, they will throw the racket or hit the ball in frustration. And that's sort of that physical outpouring of that frustration, that anger. Um, and, you know, in a tennis setting, people get fined. They've even been thrown off the uh, the court when maybe they've inadvertently hit uh, a linesman or a, one of the referees with their balls. Um, now, I don't expect that's, that's going to happen in a comedy routine, but it is very much that, you know, I'd call it a, you know, this violent you know, expression of his frustration and where he is at, at that point in time. So, yeah, a fascinating sort of way to end the, the whole performance. As you were talking, I just had this massive epiphany. Chris Rock did to the microphone what Will Smith did to Chris Rock. You know, like yeah. took, took frustration that was towards something else and physically manifested it towards the microphone. So kind of like, you know, I've used my words, I said what I had to say, but I still have this frustration, yeah, take that. Yeah, he's been looking for a way to fight back and this is finally, he can't get, uh, he can't get at will himself, but he can sure take it out. Yeah, he board. definitely, I, feel he sorry. Def I, I still feel sorry for the sound guys at the back who have to like, oh, the poor microphone, is it gonna be okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that I thought about that as well. Like when he did that, the way he did it, I was like, oh my God. But yeah, he definitely Will Smith, the microphone. So we have the contempt, we have this mic drop, and now we see something that feels off for someone who just finished a comedy performance. Uh, again, you know, throughout the years, I've seen some of the best performers in the world, and there's a certain expectation when someone ends a show. It's usually pleasant, there's a smile, there's acknowledgement, and we're seeing some of the elements, but we're seeing something else here which to me feels like more akin to watching a wrestler who just want to fight or like MMA, you know? So he's got these broader gestures, these more open things. And this open thing isn't uncommon, but it's usually with more of a gracious kind of embrace to the audience. In this case, it's more of like a grandiose posture. And uh, we talk about universal emotions a lot. As someone who teaches for the Paul Ekman group, you're very aware of the... Uh, universal expressions of emotion. But building on Ekman's work, there's also research by Tracy and Robbins that found that pride is also a universal emotion. And this is something that has a very high recognizability rate all over the world. And the way pride is displayed typically is chin up a little bit, arms akimbo, which means the arms away from the body. So typically arms akimbo means this, but it just means we're taking up space, we're confident, we feel good. So arms away from the body, chin up a little bit, and usually it's accompanied with a little bit of a smile. We're not seeing too many smiles here, a couple of quick flashes, but overall, I would describe what we're seeing here as enormous pride. Like, again, for me, it's, I said what I had to say, I was patient, this is my position, I'm allowed to say this, take that microphone, I'm proud. And the audience is, is acknowledging that he should be proud, and that's what I'm seeing there. But you were talking about some interesting stuff on the face as well. Why don't you go into that? 
Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. You do see this this pride coming through, and and I love the fact you go to the sort of the wrestling side. When I see it, I think you know Rocky Balboa and sort of a boxing sort of thing. He's on the top of the steps, um, but but it, it relates those same emotions, the pride of a fighter that's won the round. Um, you know, uh, whatever code you follow, you're absolutely seeing that that there. But it's the point you made about uh, sort of what you're seeing on the face because you don't see the smiles, you don't see the enjoyment. What you do see, though, is, and especially in the eyes, you continue to see some of that, some of that anger. Um, you see it in the glare uh, that is apparent in the eyes. And if you, if you watch the end of that broadcast a number of times, the eyes are almost bulging. You know, they're sort of this glare. And it's, for me, it's, it's a continuation of his state of mind. He's been in the fight. You even saw the, the contempt, which means, you know, he's won the fight. He's superior. And so now he's he's taking the accolades. But, you know, it's this term that, that I often refer to called the refractory period. And it's this, it's this concept where um, even, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, because when you've been in a fight, you know, for minutes and often longer afterwards, you'll be replaying that in your head. And you'll keep uh, triggering these emotional responses, often anger if you've been in a in a fight. And we all have that uh, feeling of, oh, I should have said this or I should have said that or how dare they say that. And so I, what I think we really are seeing here is um, Chris, as he's accepting those accolades, he is still sort of, he's still angry. He's still sort of reliving that fight um, and is still in that moment. So, yeah, those emotions continue to flow through right to the very end when he walks off stage. And a couple of interesting notes here. Um, he held it purposely very long. If we look at the amount of time he stood there and took that applause, it's long. And, and, and at some point, this became by design. He could have smiled at some point. He's very conscious. The guy's a very seasoned performer. I think he knew that it would be more impactful if he just stays in this more neutral tone rather than crack a smile. Because if he smiles or laughs, it, we might go, okay, it was all in good fun. I think he wants to convey that, no, this was serious. Like this was, this was my response. Here it was, bam, I'm not joking. Like, you know, I think it's by design. Definitely there is a change. There's a, there's a change in the whole presentation style, the whole demeanor when he moves into that last set. As you mentioned, entertainers, yourself, you think about what, how do you open a set and how do you close it? And he's really closed it on this emotional sort of high where this anger and all these things are, are sort of coming out. So, yeah, I think it's you definitely see that change in the facial expressions, in the emotional load. And he doesn't let go of it, which is yeah. you know really interesting to me that often we'll switch between emotions, but he is quite consistent all the way through to the end. It would have been less impactful if he did this any other way. If he put this anywhere else in the set, like in the middle, I'm just going to talk about all this Will Smith stuff, get really worked up, and then go back to making jokes, it wouldn't have had the impact. If at the end he broke this emotion of like really allowing himself to feel it, it wouldn't have had the same impact. We look at this and go, look at him. He's still feeling it. Like he's still, he's still in that moment. Look how aggravated he is and he's a really smart entertainer he knows that this is the way to drive this point home mm. yeah he didn't want to leave the audience in any doubt any doubt yeah. as to where he stood on this particular issue so that is uh, that is very clear the last thing i want to talk about with you david is something we see a lot of throughout this so we've got contempt we've got the eyes of anger we've got this pride we've got this this victor who's who's, who's looking at this audience and we're seeing a lot of lip compressions and a big lip lick at some point he, he licks the lips. Uh, David, why don't you talk to us about, you know, what we can make of that in most scenarios? Sure. And look, there's a, a range of reasons that this might happen. And when you think about it, it, make, it makes sense because, you know, he doesn't have any water there. He's been talking. He's got at least emotional um, sort of anger coming through. And so it makes sense that he's finished. He, 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 He's licking his lips, his mouth is dry. Um, so you'd expect to see some of that coming through. Um, the pressing of lips is also very indicative of, you know, the seriousness of um, what's happening. Typically you see with anger is sort of the, the lips get smaller. It's that either in a, in a closed or an open when someone's yelling, those lips to, are curled in. But uh, so I think, you know, he is taking stock. It's still a sign of him emphasizing the seriousness of what he's done 
that he carries through to the end. So that's certainly uh, what what uh, you can make in, from one perspective. But what what do you, what do you see there, Spidey? Right. So I love that you're emphasizing context. Context is so important. I love that you did that. We didn't even discuss this, but I'm so glad you did that because lip compression typically in any given situation, lip compression is either tension. So like when something's tense, like you see that kind of thing, but it's also very consistent with withheld opinion. Someone who's holding something back is often going to block the lips, retract the lips, compress the lips. Like, you know, notice how sometimes somebody might say something that you disagree with and you might go, you know, not so sure. I'm, so disagreement, withheld opinion, tension. These are all things that we can expect to see compressed lips with, but seasoned professional performers. And I'm throwing, and again, this is coming from me having spent decades on stages, seasoned professionals often become very good at lip licking. So as you said, he's stressed, he doesn't have any water. He just had this intense moment. It's very likely that his mouth is dry, but a lot of performers know that it doesn't look good to keep doing this on stage. So they become really good at retracting the lips and moistening them that way. So it, it's something we see very often in seasoned pros at the end of a set or when they're, when they're drying up on stage, um, this kind of thing, because it's just a way to lick the lips without the audience seeing. I think there's an element of that. I think he knows the cameras are on him. He knows it's the end of the set. He knows he can't be like doing this constantly. It's not a good look. So although I do believe that we're still seeing elements of that tension here, it's also a great way for him to get moisture to those lips without it being obvious. It's a habit performers develop. I don't even know if he's conscious of it. You know, sometimes people are doing it, you know, knowingly, and sometimes it's just a reflex that has been developed, but we see a lot in performers. But yeah, I agree. It's, there's definitely still tension there. Um, I don't think, it, oddly, I don't think there's much withheld opinion here. He pretty much said everything he had to say. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's stress and still a little bit of that tension and a masqueraded lip lick. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, it, it, it's once again, it's it's great to have these different perspectives because you know your experience in in the uh, you know in this field as a performer um, can uh, often reveal. And it comes back to that thing of context. Always, there's never just one thing. Always look for what could the several different things mean when you see a behaviour. So it's a great reminder that. Uh, um, yeah, that we should always be asking ourselves these questions. David, I want to thank you so much for your time here. Some amazing stuff you spotted. And I'm so thankful we had this conversation because, you know, it's like you said, like we bring different experiences to the table. And a lot of what we saw, we both saw, you know, we, we both saw the contempt, we both saw the pride. So a lot of these things, the eyes, we both saw, but there was little nuances, things that, you know, we caught that, you know, I wouldn't have seen without you. And that hopefully a few things that I spotted, like you said, from my experience on stage, so I want to thank you so much for being here with us and everyone watching, please go check out his website for more information on David's work. David, thank you so much. Thank you, Spidey. Always a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. All right. So that about wraps it up with two amazing guests this week who had a lot of really great things to say. And I think at the end of the day, we're all more or less on the same page, which is the comedy at the end turned into something that was real. We see real emotion there. Uh, coming through absolutely it's very different from his comedian emotions he's experiencing something real here he leans into it as a seasoned pro uh, really puts it out there ends his set with that because that's the way to make it the most dramatic and we just really feel it we really feel that intensity of of what he's going through something that he's held for so long coming off his chest so I want to thank Nate and David so much for being here today and really adding so much value to this analysis. Let us know in the comments what you thought and I will see you on the next one.